Dr. Sen, uh, good morning and welcome to our FDP, uh, that is Novel Materials for Next Generation Applications. Can you hear me, uh, Dr. Shukla? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes, great. Uh, I'm sure you can also uh, share your screen, I suppose. Uh, fine, maybe after a minute or two. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Sen, uh, we are really happy to have you and thank you for having accepted our invitation to speak uh, on shape memory alloys for the next one and a half hours. And uh, of course, after one and a half hours of your uh, presentation, there would be a, a short question and answer session. And uh, we are doing this FTP, the topic is novel materials for next-gen applications. We just had, uh, you know, Dr. Shukla uh, from Gujarat, uh, Shashulman Institute, who gave, uh, uh, you know, an overview of all the novel materials. Now we are digging deeper, as in we are going to each of the different classes of novel materials. So, uh, uh, well, for the sake of audience, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Sen and uh, I may need some time because it's quite a big dossier by itself. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sen, please allow me. So uh, Dr. Indrani Sen uh, completed her B.Tech from College of Ceramic Technology, University of Calcutta, and her M.Tech from Material Science Center, in Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and her PhD from the Department of Materials Engineering, in Indian Institute of Science. So this is her you now academic background. And of course, she's also, <clears throat> Uh, obviously, I will not be able to read out everything from her resume, just the highlights, the way I look at it. And uh, she's also uh, hired a different prof uh, professional positions. She was a visiting scientist at, uh, you know, in between uh, May and July 2016 at the Oak Ridge National Lab, USA. And uh, she was also, uh, she stayed at the Alexander von uh, Humboldt Renewed Research uh, in May 2000, May to July 2018 at the Rohr University, uh, Bochum, Germany. And uh, of course, she's also uh, done a postdoctoral fellow at Alexander Humboldt uh, at Chemnitz University of Technology, Germany. I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing them all right. So again, many other uh, prof professional positions and postdoctoral work she has done. She has done a lot of work and produced um, at least some 17 PG graduates and about 10 PhDs she's writing. One of them are already submitted. She's got a number of sponsored projects in various areas uh, of uh, the topic, today's topic and other areas as well. And she's a part of at least four or five projects as I see here. And I will, of course, not be able to read out everything. They really are very impressive. And uh, so, of course, Dr. Indrani Sen has many awards and recognitions. She has uh, won the Alexander von uh, uh, Humboldt Fellowship for Renewed Research Day. And uh, she's won the Venus International Women's Award for being the Outstanding Woman in Engineering, uh, VIWA 2018. She was a visiting faculty at the UT Bredesen Center and Oak Ridge National Lab US in 2016. So she had this Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship for postdoctoral research. Uh, she also has an Humboldt Lang Language Fellowship for German language by Humboldt Foundation. Uh, Guten Morgen, Fraulein. Guten <laughs> 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 Morgen. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, thank you. I mean, danke. Uh, uh, and then uh, so she's done her institute fellowship, Ministry of Human Resources, National Doctoral Fellowship. She's got the best presentation award at the uh, Ashton, you know, 20th Annual Student Symposium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. She's won an Institute Silver Medal by the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, for securing first rank in M Tech 2005. And of course, she's a member of many uh, professional bodies such as the ASTM, ASM International, IM, that is Indian Institute of Metals, Material Research Society of India, and so on. Her, uh, uh, she has a very impressive list of. Uh, journal publications, ACTA. I mean, all of us dream to publish in ACTA. She has quite a few of them, at least 25 papers, a book chapter, I mean, 31 papers as I see here and so on. So uh, she also has presented in conferences across the world. So, I mean, she's also a reviewer for renowned journals like Science, ACTA, 
materials engineering a metallurgy and metallurgical you know transactions nature materials characterization and so on and so forth so it's it's a really a privilege to have you uh, dr sen uh, with us and uh, i really wish uh, that the audience will take away a lot from your lecture today uh, welcome you once again the floor is yours i mean the screen is yours and uh, please uh, take over uh, dr sen thank you thank you very much professor funny said was so elaborate you need not to <laughs> okay uh, so good morning all the participants and let me just uh, turn off my video and share the screen good morning ma'am good morning okay uh, so my screen is visible right yes ma'am okay so uh, first of all thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to talk uh, on something which is very close to my heart on this particular material system and uh, this is a very nice uh, atp program i must say that includes uh, so many niche uh, different kind of systems which are very much uh, used in novel applications and uh, is actually enhancing the uh, uh, the the way of life and uh, so i am very happy to be a part of it and uh, of course uh, this is supposed to be the first talk for this uh, for the entire program and i would like to start with this that uh, you are going to listen many of the interesting talks on several topics and of course you are going to remember uh, the the main findings the key points something of your interest and my talk starts on a material uh, which is able to remember its shape so uh, with this analogy um, i'm going to uh, go into deeper of this materials and how this can improve our quality of life what we can actually get from this okay uh, before starting this let me just uh, i tell you where i come from so i am from this place here iit kharagpur which is the first of all the iits being uh, developed and was established in long back 1951 by the then prime minister so we do have uh, quite a history uh, for the case of iit kharagpur that when it was uh, developed uh, first of its kind of such kind of institutes um uh, it was developed on uh, the land of hijli which is uh, a place where the freedom fighters used to be jailed so we still have this is a old building like uh, many of you have seen the iic main building so similar uh, like that but we still have that old jail uh, where the freedom fighters used to be uh, kept there so our first prime minister pandit jawarla nehru was the uh, was the inaugurated this and he chosen this uh, land to uh, create a education center in that uh, special land so we uh, do have this inscripted in our main building that this is dedicated to the service of the nation um, with that this is uh, my group uh, okay well this photo was taken more than yeah almost two years back before the lockdown so some of them has uh, gone and some of them are still with us so most of the things that i'm going to uh, discuss today uh, the students have helped me preparing the slides i'm going to discuss some of our own research which again the students have done so uh, of course at the very first hand uh, they are uh, my strength so i'd like to acknowledge that uh the broad research activity that we do in our group mostly stands on correlating the microstructure property relations of materials now different kind of uh, materials and we do this at different scales at the macro scale doing the fracture and all different kind of fatigue behavior as well as in the micro scale where we do different kind of inundation and uh, do all sorts of studies there another uh, very interesting thing that uh, we are doing is to find out the behavior of the material in the in vitro condition this is particularly suitable for biomedical applications or in uh, the one which is used for marine application which has to go through some uh, corrosion atmosphere corrosive atmosphere and how the material will behave under such particular conditions 
okay uh, and uh, we also do some studies to understand the high temperature behavior particularly high temperature fatigue of aerospace materials is of our concern and we study on different kind of material and nickel titanium being one of the most significant two of my uh, students have graduated completed the phd on this nickel titanium and uh, uh, they have primarily worked on uh, uh, the evaluating the properties at uh, the, the submicron scale at small length scale as well as their in vitro property which i'm going to show also a few more slides in there and you can find all my contact details from the website okay so with this uh, uh, small thing let's start on the shape memory alloy itself So this is a material of interest which can remember its shape. Okay, now this looks, uh, this sounds very fascinating. And uh, if we want to understand more, the first thing that comes to our mind is how can it remember its shape? And that is possible by some kind of solid state phase transformation. So it has a phase initially uh, and which transforms to another phase with a different crystal structure. Uh, just with the application of temperature or stress. Okay, I will go into the uh, into more details of that. But as I understand, uh, most of you are from the background of mechanical engineering or something else, but not materials, right? Are are there some participants who are having the background of materials engineering, metallurgy, uh, anything like that? I assume that uh, most of you are not. So my talks will uh, cover the very basics of material science, which you may uh, need to understand if you want to understand the properties of these materials, okay? So uh, this is consisting of this nickel and titanium and the way they are arranged in different kinds of crystal structure actually leads to variation in their properties. So you can see that uh, this red one here is the nickel and the uh, titanium are uh, the blue ones. And they can be arranged in this form, which is a cubic form, or uh, they can be arranged in another uh, kind of way, which is called monoclinic. Okay, and all the lattice parameters of these are different. Although the material itself, the alloy itself is not changing, but because of the change in the crystal structure, there are some variation in the properties and that do all the wonders for this particular alloy. Okay, with the application of temperature or stress, we can uh, get to the second phase from the first phase. Okay, and this uh, shape memory alloy, because of this particular uh, property, this is used in various kinds of applications, starting from the human body to the space technology. So let's just uh, look into a glimpse of what are the kind of applications that it are being used. Uh, in case of the biomedical application, um, we can see that these are used in uh, uh, plates to mend the broken bones. So the bones are being fixed with the help of a plate, which is made of the shape memory alloy. Uh, it's used for the hip replacement. You can see some of the pictures here. As cardiovascular stain, this is another very interesting application where uh, this is used as a stent material to remove the clot in our uh, arteries for the blood. Okay, for orthodontic arch uh, wire, for the braces that uh, many people are using. So basically these are used also in various surgical tools uh, all over the body. And this is an example of a robotic hand that can perform on its own and do all the hand functions that our real hand can do. Okay, uh, this is a video which uh, shows how this is being used in the cardiovascular stent. So this is the artery carrying the blood and uh, we see that there is a clot because of some cholesterol or something. And when we put a stent here with the application of temperature and stress inside the body, this can expand and uh, refine the clot as much as possible that the blood flow can resume nicely. Okay. Um, this is an example uh, how the SMAs are used in aerospace and robotics. You can see that uh, this is an engine by GE, uh, and this is already in use where the SMAs are being used. And these are some of the examples of robotics. Um, shape memory alloy are finding various niche applications as sensors where they can change the shape at different temperatures or different amount of stresses. And they can be used for uh, this as sensors, as in MEMS, et cetera. 
So this again is an example of how these are used in aerospace application. You see that. So this is how this is a futuristic application, of course, how we can use uh, the flow that our typical BART use, how we can implement that in uh, shape memory and uh, structure made of shape memory the wings particularly. So this is a project by NASA. You can see it can change its wing configuration for a better flight so that it can, it can change the direction. So these are the shape memory alloy wires or structures that are being made and which functions at different temperatures in a different way. So just to imitate the nature we can do some wonderful things out of this. Okay, now I'm going to sh uh, show you another, uh, again, uh, of kind of uh, use, but a very niche application of uh, uh, shape memory alloy in space. So this is an example. Had it been a physical class, I would have asked you that what you can think of this. So this is basically a wheel of a lunar rover. So the vehicle that works in uh, the moon, okay? And uh, you can see that there are various information which will come in writing. Please go through that. are trying to use the nickel titanium based wheels which can deform to a large extent so that even in a rough terrain it can uh, go very smoothly so these are nickel titanium wires so shape memory alloy wire So uh, here comes another example of uh, shape memory alloy, which is used for making textile. Okay, so uh, material which can remember its shape if the temperature is changing. So you can imagine of making a jacket of shape memory alloy, which uh, can behave in a different way if it is in winter or in summer. Okay, just with the variation of temperature. And these are used also for uh, the robotics. Okay, the robots uh, with the kind of uh, uh, textiles and also in armors. So here again, uh, one small video here. Uh, before that, I'd like to ask, are the videos sharing the sounds also? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma yes, yes, okay. Ma okay, thank you very much. There is no sound in this particular one. It just shows that if we are spraying some hot air, how the fabric is changing its shape. Okay, we can set the previous uh, uh, shape and just by varying the temperature, we can make it roll or make it squeeze and whichever way we want. So this is also very much used in foldable um, electronics which are in trend. You can see that this girl is wearing something and just by spraying the hair dryer, it's giving the temperature and it's shrinking. Okay, 
this is just for the demonstration purpose. So this can be used for a uh, very niche kind of application where we can simply have a control of the temperature and we can get uh, differences in the shape of the material. Okay, so uh, let's remember uh, the timeline for this material. So this, this material was first discovered almost 90 years back, particularly on uh, uh, AUCD alloy. Okay, a cold alloy one by Olander, a German scientist. And uh, later on, uh, it, it was discovered first, the pseudo-elastic behavior. I will go through this terms later on. Uh, but after that, for the next 17 years, not much uh, has been done on this. And later on came the shape memory of it. So whatever temperature based uh, changing in the shape that I have shown you, that is because of the shape memory effect, which was discovered at around 1950s or so. Okay, and later on uh, in around 1963, 63 to 67, um, uh, Bueller, again, another uh, German scientist has discovered nickel titanium. Okay, and it this material amongst all shows the best of all the properties, the shape memory properties and pseudo elastic properties. And uh, it was discovered while he was working in Naval Ordnance, Ordnance Laboratory. And that's how the material has been named as nitinol. So you must have heard this term nitinol. Nitinol is often used as a synonym to shape memory alloy and nickel titanium in general. So this is how uh, it has been found. And uh, later on from 1970s onward, nickel titanium is being used for biomedical application as implants and different other ways. Okay, so it's not been very, very long that uh, this material is in use for uh, such niche application, but uh, we are seeing very uh, importance uh, and potential of this material to be used in biomedical implants and uh, different aerospace application as you have just seen. So this is some of the terminologies in uh, shape memory alloy, which I thought that you might uh, find it challenging, maybe some of you. Uh, so just, uh, here to these things once uh, before uh, we get confused with the different terminology. So first of all, shape memory alloys are often uh, known as SMS, memory metal, also another very important term, smart metal, nitinol, as I just said. And uh, then based on the properties, this could be shape memory effect. And the shape memory effect itself also can be one way or two way shape memory effect. And uh, there is another kind of effect, which is called pseudo elastic effect. Often this is uh, synonymous to super elastic effect. Okay. Uh, then there are parent phase, product phase, and there are austenite, martensite, R phase, R stands for rhombohedron. Okay. So these things will uh, come into the picture. Um, every now and then and uh, I'm going to discuss about these terms but uh, at the first end I thought of just uh, make you familiar with the terms which are important for shape memory alloys. Then there is this twin, d-twin reorientation which would be used often and uh, correspondent variant pair. So if uh, you have any uh, ideas of any material system you might be familiar with this kind of terms already. Habit plane this is the kind of plane uh, which remains fixed when one phase is changing to the other phase. Okay, stress-induced martensitic transformation and uh, temperature-induced martensitic transformation. Also, there is a phenomenological theory of martensitic transformation, PTMT. This signifies that how this transformation from austenite to martensite materializes, how these are being controlled. Okay, so there is a very strong theory for the case of shape memory alloys to understand that. So let's uh, just look into uh, that what shape memory alloys are, how the different uh, shapes are being set and what we can actually see. Okay, so this is a introductory video kind of. Prepared by MIT. Have you ever seen a material do this when it gets heated? This is not an ordinary material. This is a shape memory material. It has the ability to remember a specific shape and change into that shape when heated. So how do these materials work? 
is all based on phase transformations. You've probably seen phase transformations when water freezes. This is a transformation from liquid water to solid water. There is also a phase change when water boils. Here, the liquid water becomes water vapor. But what is the difference between the phases? The difference is how the individual water molecules are arranged. In liquid water, they are loosely packed together so they can move past one another. In ice, they are tightly packed together and they can't change places. But did you know there are actually multiple solid phases of ice? There's a hexagonal ice phase that is stable until negative 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And a cubic ice phase that is only stable below negative 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So how does this fit into shape memory materials? These materials also have multiple solid phases. There is a low temperature phase that is called martensite. But if we increase the temperature, the atomic alignment changes into another phase, called austenite. So at low temperatures, we have martensite, and at high temperatures, we have austenite. How do we set the memory shape? To set the shape that we want, we must hold the material in the austenite phase at high temperatures. Here, we have used screws to hold the wire in place on a metal plate, which we then put into the furnace to heat it. Inside the furnace, the wire transforms into austenite, which sets the memory shape. When we cool it down, it transforms into martensite, but it does so without changing the shape. In the graphic, you can see that the atoms have the martensite structure, but they align in a zigzag pattern so that the overall shape does not change. Now we can bend the wire however we like. The material does not change phase, but the alignment pattern changes slightly so that they align in one direction. This results in a permanent shape change. Now if we heat up the wire, it goes through the phase change from martensite to austenite and it returns back to its original shape. We can repeat this for almost any shape we want. Shape memory materials also exhibit another special property called superelasticity. Here's the same shape we saw before, and now we will pull it. But unlike before, this time the shape doesn't change, but it goes right back to its original shape. This is called superelasticity. This also works because of phase transformations. This material is a slightly different composition, so that at room temperature, it is in the austenite phase. If we stress the material, we can force it into the martensite phase, and this will change the shape. But if we release the stress, it goes right back to the austenite phase and the original shape because that is where it is stable at this temperature. You may have seen this before in eyeglasses that can be stretched without being permanently bent. We've shown you how the shape memory effect and super elasticity work based on phase transformations. This is an example of how material scientists study materials. They try to explain observed properties in terms of the internal structure. Then, once they understand the underlying principles, they can use them to make even better materials. Okay, so I guess that was quite informative uh, for you to understand how the shape memory alive works and what kind of, how do we get the different kind of shape and how can we set that. Okay, now, uh, as he has shown in the video that we can uh, give a different shape and can set that uh, at a particular temperature and that exact temperature depends on the material itself. Okay, so uh, coming back again to uh, the very basics of shape memory alloy, the first thing that comes to our mind is nickel titanium. As I said, that the uh, shape memory alloy has already uh, been synonymous to uh, nickel titanium, but this is uh, not it. There are different kind of shape memory alloys which are in practice, and amongst them, the most used one is of course the iron-based shape memory alloys. In case of <coughs> 
sorry in case of metallic materials if we talk about uh, metallurgy in general okay iron based system is the one that almost has uh, its major share in in all different kind of materials right this being readily available and all and uh, the fe based sms are also uh, very much cost effective okay much more cheaper versions uh, and there are uh, different kind of uh, shape memory alloys also within the fe based uh, sms itself but uh, particularly they are an alloy of iron manganese and silicon with different kind of composition and um, we can get a recoverable strain of around 3% now this recoverable strain means that if we are pulling it if you are pulling a, a material you know that up to a certain extent uh, it can recover its shape completely so if you are pulling it up to a certain stress and unload it it will come back to its original form so that is called the elastic strain for regular material uh, metallic systems this elastic strain is around 0.1% or so but for the case of shape memory alloy that is quite high in case of iron based one that is around 3% okay seems high so far but i will uh, inform about some more materials which are having different recoverable strength then amongst the uh, the ferro uh, the iron based uh, sms there are also ferromagnetic sms which uh, have this kind of shape changes and the phase transformation due to the magnetic effect okay uh, so they have magnetically induced reorientation so the kind of shape change uh, the kind of phase transformation that you have seen the similarly uh, can a similar uh, kind of phase transformation can be achieved just by just by changing the magnetic field itself and the examples are of uh, nickel manganese gallium based alloys and iron pd, PD and uh, nickel iron gallium based alloys and this material has some strain of around 3 to 6% and and, uh, this is operating within the temperature limit of 40 to 60 degree centigrade so these are the uh, this is how the domains are being rearranged by changing the magnetic field and again there is a short video which will show you that how the shape change happens just with the magnetic field so here is the magnetic field that is being applied to it and uh, a particular shape is there and once the field is removed you can see that we are getting a completely different kind of shape. So now that it is being removed, you can see that this stretches completely. Okay, so this is another kind of uh, shape memory alloy, magnetic shape memory alloy. Other than that, one which is mostly used is copper based SMS, uh, and this copper based SMS. Uh, consists of primarily copper zinc aluminum based alloys with the varying composition of zinc and aluminum and this has quite some high uh, recoverable strain of around 4 to 5% so a little better than the iron based alloys which has around 3% and then comes the most used one which is the nickel titanium based SMS and uh, it has a recoverable strain of around 8 to 10 percent so much higher than the typical elastic strain which is around one person we are getting here around 10 percent recoverable strain so which is quite high and leads to some very very interesting properties okay so these are the comparative uh, properties for all the different kind of system like nickel titanium and copper based and iron based systems and you can see uh, that the young's modulus the strength elongation etc recovery uh, strain are everything different for all of them and if we uh, look into this carefully we will see that for the case of nickel titanium these values are actually quite high um, coming to the strength part you can see that these values are quite high compared to the copper based or uh, the, even the iron based system and the recovery recovery strain as i said is of course much higher compared to any other kind of alloys okay and uh, what we are seeing low here is the young's modulus which actually we prefer to have low if we are thinking of the biomedical kind of application so along with that this is again a comparative uh, 
uh, chart for the temperature of interest. Okay, so at what temperature? So this alloy, as I have shown, so this is a magic alloy. It can remember its shape is fine, but this can happen only at some specified temperature range. And for the case of nickel titanium based alloy, we see that this temperature range is around uh, minus 50 to plus 100 degrees centigrade. Okay, so quite related to the room temperature and a little bit uh, on both the sides. Uh, we can still get a higher temperature range also in the nickel titanium by adding some hafnium, zirconium, platinum, etc. And the, for copper base, we are uh, having this temperature within 100 to 250 degrees centigrade or so on. Okay, so uh, based on all this different kind of properties and the temperature range, we have seen that nickel titanium somehow survives as the best material, which is having the highest recoverable strain of around 8 to 10 percent, quite high compared to any other standard metallic system. And it has a suitable transformation temperature, uh, whereas superior strength and elastic moduli, which matches with that of the human bone. So that is why it is uh, being used as implants in many cases. It is also biocompatible. So that is another important property of nickel titanium, which, is made, uh, which has made it important candidates for biomedical application. Plus it is corrosion resistant. It has very good uh, corrosion resistance and it has a quite high damp damping capacity. So in the earthquake prone uh, zone, also nickel titanium are being used to utilize its damping uh, capability where uh, structures can be made out of this, or at least the framework can be made out of nickel titanium, which is not going to collapse in, uh, damp in, in such kind of uh, earthquake. Okay, so these are... Um, now that we know that nickel titanium is giving us the best of the properties, we'd like to have a look on how, what these properties are. And uh, as I have said that the two phases of importance here are austenite and martensite, and the different properties are shown for both these phases. And these blue ones here highlight the properties of interest if you're talking about mechanical uh, applications. And uh, we see that the Young's modulus of the martensite phase is the lowest, which is what is um, very similar to human bone. For human bone, it is around 10 to 20 GPA. And uh, uh, as once again, the ultimate tensile strength is high, the recoverable strength uh, strain is high and so on. So with this, let's uh, look into the typical uh, stress strain diagram of the uh, nickel titanium based SMA. And these are some of the fascinating thing that we can see that at high temperature, this material can behave like a regular elastic plastic material. Okay, It has some elastic deformation. Following this, there's some permanent deformation. Whereas uh, if uh, we use it at intermediate temperature, we can uh, see some pseudo elastic behavior where it can uh, behave elastically deform elastically up to a certain extent and then it has it is uh, showing a strain plateau following which if we are unloading it is coming back to the initial shape okay uh, so unlike uh, the regular elastic plastic one this kind of behavior is known as pseudo elastic effect whereas at low temperature we can still have some kind of hysteresis and this is related to the shape memory effect Okay, if we are um, going to some places where it was really at low temperature, we can have that. Okay, so, and this is, of course, is related to the composition of this particular alloy, and we can vary with the composition and get uh, different kind of properties at different temperatures. Okay, so we, being the engineers, are always uh, not satisfied with what, whatever has been given to us. We always want to engineer things at our own wish so that we can get it uh, to use at our own, uh, to meet our own expectation level. Right. So uh, if we are using at low temperature, we are getting the shape memory effect. If we are using at high temperature, comparatively high temperature, of course, we are uh, getting the pseudo elastic effect. So let's have a look of what do I mean by that. So as I said that uh, nickel titanium can recover its shape by the application of stress or the reduction in temperature or for both. And this is possible because of the conversion of this austenite phase to martensite. 
okay, uh, through the, the correspondent variant pairs. I'm just going to explain that in details. And this is being reflected in its stress strain behavior accordingly. So initially, let's say we are having the austenite phase, okay, which is a cubic structure. Uh, kind of this is a B2 structure where uh, the nickel atoms are at the corners and the titanium is at the body center and vice versa in the adjacent um, atom, in adjacent crystal lattice. And uh, so, so this is what it is in 2D. And if we are applying stress at certain value of stress, it starts to convert to martensite. Okay? And this martensite is having a monoclinic structure, B19 prime. So it converts to this, and uh, after that, there is a amount of strain within which this conversion of austenite to martensite is going on, and then there is another uh, formation which is uh, the detwinning of the martensite. The martensite initially, which are formed, uh, is in twin structure, and if we are keep on applying the stress, actually the stress application is only very minimal, but we can see a large increment in the strain value, and this is because of the stretching of the martensite or the detwinning. This is also called reorientation. Okay, now starting from here, where we have uh, completely martensite, fully martensite structured. So this is basically the martensite finished stress. And if we are uh, unloading it from here, it comes back to the austenite. Once again, a complete reversible phase transformation occurs and it reaches the austenite. So this entire amount of strain that is being generated can be recovered. And this particular, this strain is called the recoverable strain. So recoverable strain consists of not only the elastic strain, but also the uh, pseudo elastic strain. This process, because it is very similar to that of elasticity as in terms of the strain recoverability, this is called pseudo elasticity. Okay, the same thing. Uh, so you can see this as a stress strain diagram. This is an experimental one. And uh, you can see that we have an elastic limit and then there is a Plato strain, which actually signifies that this entire strain will be recovered. And then there is a martensitic deformation. Okay, uh, we have a fully martensite structure at this point, And afterwards there will be a elastic deformation and plastic deformation on martensite till it fails. So, this is what we are going to get if we are deforming a nickel titanium based or for that matter, any pseudo elastic material. Okay, now the same thing can, uh, so you can see this is another example of uh, the practical experimental result where we can deform it up to this amount of strain. And then if we are unloading, we can come back to the zero level of strain. Okay. Now the same thing can be also achieved if we are just changing the temperature and we, we are not applying any stress or anything. So this is an isobaric condition and we are simply playing around with the temperature. Then also we are going to get similar kind of things. This is once again, some experimental results. So we have um, initially heated the specimen up to 150 degrees centigrade and then we start on cooling. And you can see that at one particular temperature, we are going to get a peak. So this is the martensite start temperature and we are getting a peak and which completes at a martensite finish temperature and when we are heating it back we are getting the austenite start and finish condition okay so we can achieve the reversible martin austenite to martensite to austenite transformation if we are simply changing the temperature okay and shape memory effect is partly related to this kind of temperature induced process Okay, and this phase transformation uh, from austenite to martensite by whatever way, either with the application of temperature or with the application of stress, this happens in a certain way. Actually, it can happen in 24 different ways. So one particular grain of austenite, okay, just excuse me for a minute. Okay, sorry about that. So uh, uh, when we are uh, converting an austenite to martensite, that can happen in 24 different ways. So one particular grain of austenite can transform into one particular grain of austenite, uh, martensite in one of the 24 different ways. 
just do an advanced pen. So, uh, and in the process of this transformation, uh, there is uh, supposed to be a habit plane, a plane which is not going to change its transformation, uh, its uh, position. Okay, so you can see that this is the parent phase here, the black phase, the dotted phase one, and this can convert to uh, this orange phase here, but the habit plane will remain the same for both the phases. Okay, so this is very important and which of these 24 different ways uh, the alloy will choose for the conversion depends on the critical result shear stress. Okay, the one that can meet uh, the, the critical stress for the transformation, it can happen only on that plane. So that is being dictated by the theory, uh, which is called the phenomenological theory of martensitic transformation. You can uh, find the details of uh, all those in this papers, but I thought that this uh, is beyond the scope of this uh, present presentation. And I've not gone to much details of that. Okay, so now when the conversion from austenite to martensite is over, this martensite initially forms in a, a twinned condition, right? And uh, to draw an analogy, I'm just showing you the picture of this carton. So what happens is that now with the application of stress, this twins can spread itself, right? So this is called the reorientation or detwinning, where you can think of stretching these cartons, and that is how it will uh, generate the amount of strain. It is getting a different shape. Of course, there is not much uh, enhancement in the stress in the process. So we, that is why we are going to see a plateau in the uh, stress strain diagram. And uh, that is of how this entire thing is uh, giving us a strain that can be recovered. So once we are uh, unloading it or we are removing the temperature, it is or adding the temperature, it is going back to the austenite phase. So it is going back to its uh, unstretched form between one and we can recover this amount of strain back. Okay, now, as I said that this can happen in uh, two ways, either with the application of stress or with the application of temperature. So just uh, thought of showing you that how this can happen. Uh, so initially, if we are at a temperature higher than the austenite finish temperature means uh, that if we are applying stress, this austenite grains have no other way to deform other than by converting to martensite, right? So this is what is termed here as operation A, and uh, this is what we are getting as a stress-induced martensite. On the other hand, if we are cooling it, then also we are going to get the martensite in the uh, twin form, and this is called the thermally-induced martensite, TIA. Okay. And from here also, this TIM, if we are applying further stress, it can stretch or reorient D twin itself and we can end up having these phases here. So uh, the as I was telling that which of the CVP will be activated, that depends on the critical result shear stress along that CVP. Okay, so all these 24 different ways, uh, whichever is leading based on this value of tau CRSS being higher than the uh, tau critical, that particular CVP will get activated. Okay, so this is how, what is being happening in a thermoelastic transformation and in a non-thermoelastic one where we are seeing this T-twin structure and of the uh, twin structure initially. Okay, now, this is uh, a very interesting part, which shows the stress temperature uh, correlation for the case of SM. Now, what happens is that I have shown you the isobaric condition when we are simply not applying any stress and we are simply varying the temperature. Okay? So x-axis here is the temperature and uh, y-axis is the stress. So let's say we are not applying any stress and we are continuously uh, cooling. Uh, the temperature of the material, right? So at one particular temperature, it will uh, start forming martensite. So that is the MS temperature. If we keep on cooling it farther, it will complete the formation of martensite and that is the martensite finish temperature. On the other hand, if we are increasing the temperature, we are having initially austenite start and austenite finish and so on, 
right? Similarly, if uh, the same material, if we are uh, uh, applying some amount of stress, let's see what happens to the MS temperature. So now with the application of stress, this MS temperature is increasing than the isobaric dilution, right? For the same material, we can have the MS temperature much higher if we are some uh, applying some amount of stress to it. Or in other words, if we want to achieve the martensite conversion, okay, at a higher temperature, we need to apply some amount of stress to it. Okay, so that is what is being shown. And uh, similarly here also you can see that this is uh, at one particular temperature, isothermal condition, right? And if we are applying stress, then only it will form martensite at this particular temperature. So if you're keeping the temperature fixed, we have to apply certain amount of stress. Then only we can achieve the martensite start and martensite finish and so on. Right, and if we are unloading, we are getting austenite start and austenite finish, etc. So based on this kind of diagram, we can combine the stress and the temperature based on our application. If we know that there are certain stress that will be applied, or if we know that the temperature is uh, has to be within certain range, we can vary around with the stress or the temperature based on our need. And you can see that this is a stress strain diagram at different condition. If we have the, <clears throat> the application temperature higher than the austenite finish temperature, uh, we can have this uh, kind of stress strain diagram. <coughs> Sorry, whereas if we are uh, having the transformation temperature, uh, um, sorry, the application temperature less than the martensite finish temperature, we can have the stress strain diagram, which is quite below the previous one. Okay, so uh, based on our need, based on our application, we can play around with uh, the stress and the temperature combo and we can achieve whatever we want. Okay, now this makes us happy. As I said, that being engineer, we always want to have things in our control. And we'll be very happy to control the, uh, the stress or temperature to get the required properties, right? So coming to the details of the properties. So this material, as I said, uh, is supposed to show us either shape memory effect or the uh, pseudo elastic. So the shape memory effect is the most significant one. That is how this alloy is known as shape memory alloy. So what it does is if we are, so we have three axes here, stress and uh, this one is temperature and this one is strain here. So X, Y, and Z, okay? So if we are cooling the alloy, uh, we will see that there will be martensite. So from the austenite, the structure will form martensite in a twinned form. <coughs> Okay, and uh, on that twinned martensite, if we are applying stress, then uh, this is what is happening. Uh, it is going through detwinning, as I said, the stretching of the twins, and that leads to some amount of strain. This detwinned martensite can deform elastically, and when we are unloading, it is coming back to the same form, the detwinned martensite here, okay? And uh, finally, if we are again hitting it back to the starting temperature, it goes to the, the austenite form itself here. So it completes this entire hysteresis just with the reduction in temperature and then stressing and then unloading and coming back to heating the alloy. Okay, and we are going to get to the, uh, to the initial step itself. So this is what is shown in details here. And I thought that you will like this colorful picture uh, better. A source, of course, is the internet, where you have the initially austenite structure shown here with the yellow grains. And then we have the twin structure. You see that uh, how the twins are of two different um, uh, colors, which signifies two parts of the twins. And uh, when we are deforming that, applying any kind of loading, in this case, it's bending, but you can simply stretch it under tension or compression, we can get the the, uh, the deformed martensite and the detwinning also is happening over some uh, stretch. And finally, if we are heating, we are again getting back the, uh, the initial structure as austenite. And this entire deformation can be recovered completely. Okay. Now, uh, this is the typical 
uh, the, the one-way shape memory effect that is the most typical of the properties. And there is another very interesting, fascinating property that has been found for this material, which is called the two-way shape memory effect. This is also initially known as reversible shape memory effect. Shape memory itself is a reversible thing. And uh, we have seen that there is a reversible shape memory as well. So later on, this is uh, named as two-way shape memory effect. And this uh, days, it is most popularly known as 2WOSNA. So what happens here is that it can remember its shape in two forms. So not only it can remember its uh, in the initial shape that has given to it in austenite, but it can also remember its shape that has been given to it in the Martin sign. And to achieve this two-way shape memory effect, what is necessary is to train the material. Okay, the uh, this kind of terminologies are very similar to our life. Right, we need to train something to to remember. Right, the material also behaves. It's, it's a smart material. That's uh, how it is. So uh, we can train it in two different phases, in the austenite phases as well as in the martensite phases, so that the material can remember its uh, shape in the austenite and martensite both way. Okay, so uh, here is an example. Uh, which shows that if it is initially something like this, uh, like this, a dog bone shaped structure, it uh, can remember its uh, shape and come back to this uh, form, even if we are loading it to uh, quite some high extent, or it can remember its shape in this form as well. So depending on the training, we can achieve different kind of uh, stresses, uh, uh, different kind of shapes that it is supposed to remember. Okay, so this is just an example which shows that how the material is going to remember its shape in two different form. So you can see that this is a hot water or hot liquid and this is a cold liquid and the spring can have two different shapes. Okay, this is uh, with the change in the diameter. You can see that this is quite high and this is quite low. So just by changing the, uh, the media temperature, we can play around with it. And what kind of shape it will achieve in both the condition will depend on the kind of training that we have provided. Okay. We help the alloy to remember its shape in one particular phase and can keep on doing that. So this is rotating on its own just by uh, adding some temperature to it. So as you can understand, this is very well uh, used for the case of sensors where uh, you have one particular shape at one temperature and simply by changing the temperature, uh, the shape changes. So we can use this for cutoff in, in any kind of application. Just by pouring it into the liquid, it is changing its shape automatically. Also, we in uh, this way can obtain multiple ASMA okay, by uh, different kind of training here. Fine, so uh, coming back uh, from the pseudo, uh, sorry, from the shape memory effect one way or two way, we again embark on the pseudo elastic effect, which is when we are achieving this kind of phase transformation and the associated recoverable strain simply with the addition or the removal of stress itself, okay, stress or loading. And the temperature in any way is constant in this case, it's isothermal. So what we are seeing here is that uh, it is initially in the austenite uh, condition. And if we are applying uh, stress to it, it converts to the martin side and the D2 in martin side, as you can see here. So it stretches up to a certain level. And then we are removing the stress. It is coming back. Uh, to the Martin site and the tuning process and coming back to the austenite, the initial phase itself. Okay, so that the entire strain is completely recoverable and that as um, similar to the elastic recoverable strain is often known as super elastic 
So it's elastic to a very high extent or pseudo elastic. So it's uh, basically it looks like elasticity, but of course this is not because of elasticity, but this is rather because of the reversible phase transformation that is happening. This is again uh, shown this in uh, greater details where we can see the austenite converting to martensite, which is partially detwinned initially and then completely detwinned here at the austenite and the martensite crystal structure. And if we are uh, um, uh, loading it, it is coming back to the austenite phase itself. Okay, so uh, with this uh, little bit detailed introduction about shape memory alloy, I would like to discuss some of our findings which we have recently found um, in our group activities and uh, would uh, like to bring some highlights on the updated research that are going on on shape memory alloy. Okay, so just for a few seconds, if, if uh, everything is clear so far to you or uh, since I like uh, teaching, actually, I would like to take this opportunity to just ask you if you have any question uh, on the very basic facts, you can ask me now. If not, of course, at the end, there will be a question answer session, but I thought of that if, if there is any doubt that you might be having at the moment. Uh, okay. So then maybe the questions can come at the end and they'll also type in the chat box so that it's better uh, that you okay. continue and uh, leave the questions for the end. Okay, okay, fine. Um, thank you very much. So, so let us just continue. Now, this is the uh, thing with the online teaching that we cannot see the faces and we cannot judge that whether the participants or attendees are actually uh, with us or not. So that's why I thought of asking. Fine. So let's just move on uh, to our group activities then. So we uh, focus much more on the pseudo elastic properties of nickel titanium. And we work on different categories of nickel titanium and uh, in different forms. So this one work here is um, focused on the wire. It has a very thin diameter of 300 micrometer, very thin. And uh, you see that when we are using these as stems, uh, or even in any other kind of in archways, orthodontic archways or so, we use wires of very fine dimension. So that's why we thought of our uh, focus of our work uh, was on the wire to evaluate the properties. Now this is the wire, uh, um, starting with the cold drawn wire one, and this is the typical stress strain. Uh, diagram for this wire. Okay, you see that this is uh, shows some elastic one, and then there is a nice pseudo elastic plateau, and then there is a martensitic deformation and all. And uh, we have also uh, shown that this is pseudo elastic. Slowly, we'll come through that. Um, our focus, however, is to evaluate the properties in biological atmosphere. So initially what we did is uh, we looked into the microstructure of the wire inside. So this is the cross section of the wire and we can see that there are some cracks and some precipitates which are forming in the wire. We did the typical uh, indentation behavior at the very first hand to evaluate the properties of the material, the mechanical properties. Uh, for the localized volume, and we see that uh, it gives us a hardness and elastic modulus, which is uh, quite similar to what is expected for this material. Okay, the elastic modulus is something like around 60 GPA, which is what is expected for this material in the austenite phase. Okay, so uh, thermal analysis is a very crucial part of studying anything on shape memory LR because we want to figure out that what are the transformation temperature, at what temperature we can use it. And we have seen that uh, this is a DSC curve. Uh, and uh, what we have uh, seen is that uh, this material undergoes a transformation from austenite to martensite at temperature of around 30, 30 or 32 degrees centigrade. And when we are heating it, it uh, converts, starts converting the austenite at around minus eight degrees centigrade. And uh, it finally uh, completes the formation of martensite at 32 degrees centigrade. Okay, so at room temperature, which uh, for our case in, in our country, most of the time it's around 30 degrees centigrade or so, we have dominantly austenite phase at room temperature. Okay, and uh, 
again, doing into the phase analysis through extra diffraction, we can see that there are some precipitates. Now, these precipitates are carbides, basically, TRH carbides. And this is going to have some importance in its failure behavior. Okay, we'll go through the details of that. But first of all, let me explain our target of the work. So what we wanted to figure out is that if we are going to use it as an implant in a human body, then what it needs to overcome, there are uh, two different kinds of scenarios that can happen. First of all, there are uh, the blood and the human body fluid that uh, it uh, th that can have some effect, some corrosive effect on the material. And secondly, there could be some loading, repeated loading. If it is being used as an orthodontic archware or a cardiovascular stent, there is a repeated loading that always happens, right? So that can lead to some uh, mechanical uh, loading and that can lead to some fatigue. So this is what our target of work is to find out its behavior in uh, such condition. So we chose a uh, biofluid to work with. And the first thing that we use is a Ringer's lactate. Ringer's lactate is nothing but the saline solution that we use uh, if you have ever uh, come to the hospital for uh, this. This is the saline that is being hanged to us. And, uh, and the second thing that we use is a simulated body fluid, which is having a composition very similar to the blood plasma. Okay, so what we did is we immersed this wire specimen into such uh, uh, atmosphere, into this ringer's lactate and the simulated body fluid, and we have done the corrosion uh, test of this. Okay, now the uh, the pH level for this ringer's lactate or the simulated body fluid are different, and that leads us to that the ringer's lactate is actually more corrosive to nickel titanium. What it does is, as I said, that nickel titanium is overall corrosion resistant to some extent. So what it does is it forms a protective layer of the corrosion product on the surface itself. Okay, so it forms the chloride and the oxides and form a layer on the surface. What we found is that, that this layer is much thicker in the case of the Ringer's lactate, which is having lower pH, in comparison to that, in case of SBF, and we are immersing this in SBF for prolonged time, we still have a corrosion resistant layer which is forming, but this layer is quite thin in the case of SBF. Okay, so with this knowledge, we progressed to do the tensile test. So what we did is we have the wire which is uh, uh, being tested in a UTM. So this is a universal testing machine for testing the tensile compression fatigue failure of a material. Okay, the wire is being hanged here using a specialized grip. And uh, this is a chamber, a bio chamber in which we put different kind of liquid of our interest. So we put either Ringer's lactate or the simulated body fluid. And most importantly, we maintain the temperature of this fluid at uh, to human body temperature. Okay. Uh, so uh, that is what uh, we have used. And uh, so that means that the testing is being done at the human body temperature while the specimen is immersed in the uh, fluid of our choice, the fluid of concern. Okay, so it's 34 degrees centigrade. And uh, what we have seen is that the material, uh, so this black one is without this chamber and the blue one is in presence of the Ringer's lactate. As an example, we have seen that in both the cases, the material has shown perfectly pseudoelastic behavior. It has stretched up to a certain extent and then upon unloading, it has come back to zero. So we can see complete strain recoverability. Fine. Now, uh, moving on to the uh, complete stress strain diagram at uh, in, in presence of uh, just the air, the ambient condition, as well as in presence of Ringer's lactate or SBF, we have seen that more or less it has shown almost similar kind of behavior. It has shown pseudoelasticity also, and it has shown simil similar kinds of uh, the ultimate tensile strength and total elongation and so on. So not much influence of the corrosive atmosphere or the body temperature has been seen. Okay, uh, maybe uh, there is one mic microphone can be muted from one of your end. Okay, so uh, now with this, so tensile behavior so far is uh, showing uh, not much influence on the properties. And the next thing we did is we did the 
fatigue behavior. We uh, try to find out the high cycle fatigue behavior. Now in this kind of material, uh, and along with the repeated loading, there is one thing else which is also happening repeatedly is the phase transformation. So it's continuously if we are loading and unloading, there is the austenite which is con converting to martensite and back to austenite and back to martensite and so on, right? So that also leads to another kind of damage in this materials, which is called functional fatigue. So these two are very significant for shape memory alloy in general, and we try to figure out the effect of this. Uh, this is just the, the overall uh, results of the study that we got. And uh, this is a typical SN curve, the stress amplitude versus number of cycles it can survive. And we have seen that for uh, uh, number of cycles of around 10 to the power six, we have seen that the material in air can survive for the highest amount of stress, which is around 140 MPa. And if we are tasting the material at uh, in presence of uh, some kind of fluid, some kind of corrosive fluid, and at human body temperature, um, we see that uh, the fatigue strength is reducing. Okay, it is coming to 100 MPa only if we are doing the test in. SBA. So once again, we explain this with the help of the corrosion layer that is forming. So this corrosion layer also has a very significant role to play in case of mechanical loading, in case of um, fluctuating loads where it is supposed to uh, break up and can initiate the crack. So this crack initiation and all has also been tested through the detailed fractography. Uh, and we can see the uh, the crack initiation site, etc., from uh, uh, these things. And uh, we also have located that uh, wherever these pores are there, there were some voids initially of the PIC precipitates, the carbide precipitates that also could lead to the crack initiation. So the details of this could be found in the publication that I was just showing. So this is one uh, very interesting work which I thought uh, that you'd um, learn. Fine, so uh, the next thing that I would like to emphasize is the effect of grain orientation. So remember we were discussing about the importance of CVPs, which one will get activated out of the 24 one. So the behavior of this material, although it sounds very uh, fascinating, but there is a lot, if we want to control, there is a lot more we need to understand before we are able to control it. So the next thing from the wire, we moved on to the rod. Okay, so you can see that this is just a nickel titanium rod of uh, diameter around 10 uh, millimeter. Okay, and uh, we made a typical uh, um, dog bone shaped tensile specimen out of this and we can uh, we have seen that this material behaves like a perfectly pseudo elastic one one second so be it a wire or a rod it behaves like a perfect pseudo elastic material okay the entire material as a bulk but does it uh, behave in the same fashion if we are considering the localized behavior of it that was our question and uh, so we tried to figure this out uh, we did the initial atomic composition and the thermal analysis, phase analysis to confirm that this material is austenite at room temperature. And when we have looked into the microstructure, you can see that this is a polycrystalline one. Usually, any unless this is otherwise specially prepared, usually a material itself is um, a polycrystalline. In most of the cases, it has grains with uh, a multiple orientation. So this, the color, different colors here signi uh, signifies the grains with different orientation, the principal direction oriented along particular things. So the blue one here signifies 111, the typical green one here is 101, and there are different shades of colors for this entire stereographic triangle. So what we intend to is to find out the pseudoelastic property of each of these grains with different orientation. Okay, now uh, this uh, being particularly dependent, now each of this grain is an austenite one at room temperature, right? But this austenite are having uh, same crystal structure, but oriented along different directions. As you can see, this color signifies that, right? So when we are talking about the transformation from austenite to martensite, it is not necessary that all the grains will deform at the same starting martensite transformation stress, 
Okay, this depends on whichever CVP will get activated first. That particular grain will deform, uh, will convert to martensite more easily. Okay, to figure that out, we took the help of nano indentation. This shows an example how nano indentation works. So we basically indent with a sharp one and we create an impression we get the load versus depth of penetration curve. And from there, we can understand the hardness of the material, the elastic modulus of the material, as well as how much depth it can recover, how much depth is the permanent and so on. So what we did is we smartly used this polycrystalline system and where each of these grains are nothing but a kind of single grain, uh, single crystal and we indented using spherical indenter with uh, a quite blunt tip, we indented on several grains, several of the grains actually. And these uh, dots here signifies some of uh, the, uh, the, the representative one. So this is schematically shown basically, okay. And for each of these grains, uh, so this is again an, a representative indentation load versus indentation depth curve, which is what it is supposed to be for a nickel titanium alloy. Okay, this is one for the case of steel, where we can see this is the typical pH curve, that is how it looks like. P means indentation load and H signifies indentation depth. Uh, and in comparison, this is for the nickel titanium, you can see that this is completely different from that of steel, right? Just for you to understand that the recoverable strain here, okay? For the case of steel, this is only, this blue part is only very, very less. Whereas in this case, uh, this case of the nickel titanium combining both the elasticity and the uh, pseudo elastic part, you can see that quite a lot of extent of the, uh, the total depth can be recovered in case of nickel titanium. So we did uh, this for several grains. We did this for around hundreds of grains and you can see, please mute yourself. That's all right. okay. Someone who had turned on your microphone, I request you to please mute. Okay, thank you very much. So we have done this kind of indentation study on several grains and you can see that we almost have covered the entire stereographic triangle having different, different orientations. Okay, the, the colors here signifies the colors as per the stereographic triangle of the electron backscattered diffraction image. Okay, and what we could figure out is that the pH curve for these grains are completely different, completely different. And we converted, we have a unique way of uh, converting this to a stress strain diagram. And uh, we have seen that again, the stress strain curves and the pH curves for these are completely different. So although the entire material, if you make a tensile sample out of this and we load it in tension and unload it, we see a complete pseudo elasticity. But each of these grains are behaving in a completely different way. So if we want to use it for miniaturized application, we would prefer to have a single crystal of that particular direction, which will give us the best pseudo elasticity. That was what our target is. And you can see that one of the grain here shows very nice pseudo elastic pattern in comparison to others, which shows very high plastic deformation part. So we would like to avoid such kind of grains, which, would, uh, which are giving us plastic deformation. And we would be happy to work on something which is giving us pseudo elastic deformation. So uh, this is how we figured out, we found out the easy uh, orientation. Easy means the one which is, uh, which can convert to pseudo elasticity very easily and hard means one which uh, is not uh, pseudo elastic. So we also found out the recoverable strain and uh, we could figure uh, that out. And this, uh, if you uh, are interested to go through the details, you can find in this actor material publication here, where we have shown the importance of the different uh, uh, grains and uh, the different indentation parameters and so on. Okay.
So from there, we also have looked into further details on the effect of uh, different heat treatment basically. Okay, so what we know for this alloy is that if we are changing the heat treatment, we are able to generate the precipitate. And if this precipitates are generating, then that is supposed to influence the property in a big way. So let's see, uh, we are uh, again working on the same rod. And uh, we know that this material itself is pseudoelastic in the bulk scale, but what happens microstructurally, what happens in the local scale is what is of our interest. And we, um, for that, we knew that uh, if we are doing a heat treatment in the temperature range of 300 to 800 degrees centigrade, we are supposed to form nickel rich precipitates out there. Okay, and if these precipitates are forming, then that is influencing the stress level. So if, you, if there is a precipitate, there is a stress, localized stress that is forming, and there is a strain mismatch between the precipitate and the surrounding matrix, and that can lead to all such differences in their properties in the pseudoelastic behavior. So we started with the, the same one without any heat treatment. So this is basically a solutionized alloy, and uh, we also have the precipitated alloy. Okay, and what uh, we knew is that uh, the precipitated one is having different kind of phases, like the martensite phase and the precipitate phase, even at room temperature. Okay, now uh, if we have this kind of precipitate phase, this is supposed to give us not only the austenite to martensite transformation, but there is an intermediate transformation through R phase. Now R phase is another unstable phase, uh, product phase, which is having a rhombohedral uh, shape. Okay, so this austenite phase is converting to R phase and that finally converts to uh, the martensite phase. So there is a two-step conversion that is happening. This is uh, what is seen from the DSC uh, thermograms itself. Okay, and uh, uh, differential scanning calorimetry, and you can see that in uh, case of the, the precipitated one, we have the two peaks here, very distinct peaks, where the one is for the R phase transformation and the second is for the Martin side transformation. Okay, now uh, this is when we are not applying any stress to it. We are simply doing the temperature change, and this is what we are going to see, right? Very importantly, what we have seen is that this martensite start and finish temperature for the case of the solutionized alloy versus the precipitated alloys are distinctly different. And even more important to that, uh, than that is that the austenite start and finish temperature in this case where we have not, we do not have the precipitate, the austenite finish temperature is only three degrees centigrade. So this means that the material is in completely austenite form at room temperature. Whereas if we have some precipitates in it, the austenite finish temperature is very close to room temperature which means that there is a possibility that the austenite transformation is not yet uh, fully done at uh, room temperature. In uh, this case, if you are considering at 300 K, maybe the austenite finish is not yet complete. And this can be reflected in its indentation behavior as well. As you can see, this pH curve are completely different. The blue one is for the solutionized one and the green one is the uh, for the precipitated one. And we see completely different behavior. The same thing can be seen for the case of the stress strain curve obtained from the indentation where the precipitated one shows much, uh, the curve being much lower. So everything, and this uh, also, you can, if you notice this carefully, you can see that even the elastic part of this, the elastic modulus part is also different. And this is related to the presence of the martensite phase in the matrix. The martensite phase, as I mentioned earlier, has much lower elastic modulus, and that leads to variation in all kinds of properties, the recoverable strain, the elasticity, the overall strength, everything is going to change if we simply play around with the composition or the heat treatment to generate the precipitates. So this is another interesting thing that uh, I'd like to highlight today uh, for you to understand that this is uh, not only the material, but also the internal structures of the material, the internal composition uh, that we can play around to have control on the different behavior of the material. 
Okay. So uh, uh, next, I'm going to move on a very state of the art uh, process of making nickel titanium. So we have used an additively manufactured nickel titanium to understand how uh, the, the effect of different processing parameters. So we have used the same nickel titanium alloy, but use different processing parameters while making it through additive manufacturing. And you are going to see that how that can also influence the processing uh, uh, the property of the material in turn. So we have this nickel titanium produced by lesser engineered made shaping based additive manufacturing. Okay, so uh, this additive manufacturing as um, some of or many of you will be aware of is that this is a way by which we can produce a material directly like we are printing it uh, in, in a single state. So whatever is a complicated structure, we can achieve it in one particular state based on the different kind of additive manufacturing technique that we can use. And we have selected one, which is a lens based. It's laser engineered net shaping. So here is a, a small video showing out how the lens system work. So these are basically uh, the powder feeder. We use the whatever material we want to print, we use those in the, in the form of powders through this powder feeder. And this is um, being uh, spread there. And then there is a laser unit which applies the energy So the powders are uh, scanned as per a particular design. So we set a design through a CAD, uh, computer aided design, and you can see that the powders are flowing from here. And then the laser beam is coming from the top and the powder locally is getting melted and it is re-solidified. Okay, so based on the shape, we are going to use the powder. This entire uh, wing can move in certain direction and the, the chamber here can move in a certain uh, direction based on the, uh, the shape of the design that we want to print. And it is directly printing. So the entire structure is being formed here. And later on, we can remove the structure from the substrate and we can get a particular uh, complicated shape of our choice. Okay, so uh, this is the system that we have used. Uh, this is the entire thing is done inside a glove box so that there is no uh, in controlled atmosphere. And uh, so what we used is what we again have control here in the case of uh, additive manufacturing is we can control the laser power, the scanning speed, etc. Right. So based on this, we actually are controlling the laser energy density. So during the process itself, we can uh, control the laser energy density. We use the same powder and we use, uh, use the same design to make a product or something, but we use different, three different energies. Okay, the one which is having the list is 27 joule per millimeter cube and uh, the highest one uses 70. And we name this as E1, E2, E3. Okay, so we are starting with the same powder. We are using the same powder. We are just varying the processing parameters of the additive manufacturing to end up having three different products. Okay, now this is the, uh, the schematic of the product. What we did is we did a detailed microstructural investigation. Okay, at different sections from the top, middle, bottom, at different uh, planes, X, Y, Y, Z, etc. And uh, we have seen that the microstructure is actually quite different. We still uh, can find the layer by layer, the signature. So the layer by layer process itself, there's an EVST diagram and these are the optical micrographs. You can see that this uh, layered structures are very much clear. And if you look into the details, we can see uh, this kind of uh, loops here. These are called the hatch. And um, 
uh, we actually can see the variation of the microstructural size and uh, shape and morphology overall. We can have columnar to equates and coarse and finer structures with different sizes. Okay, so there is a microstructural non-uniformity that we have figured out. Not only that, based on the laser energy density, we have also noted that the one produced with the highest energy density is mm, producing some precipitates in the alloy. Okay, so although we started with the same powder composition, even if uh, uh, with the same powder composition with different processing energy can lead to formation of different phases. So uh, that is how we are changing the uh, microstructure also. And uh, this one is just shows the porosity inside the structure that is forming because of the direct printing that can form some porosity. And we have done the 3D analysis of the, uh, the pores that are forming. And uh, this is done for all the three alloys. And you can very clearly see it from here that uh, while for the alloy prepared with the lowest energy density has quite some pores or unmold um, parts, the one prepared with the highest energy density is uh, devoid of such big pores, mostly devoid of. Okay, these are the XRD uh, patterns for all these things. And we can see that we started with the same powder in all the three cases, whereas we end up having different, different phases uh, if we are varying the laser energy densities. Okay, mm, same goes for the DSC thermogram once again. So the, uh, the scanning calorimetry actually shows that there is a variation in the austenite and martensite start and finish temperatures if we simply vary the energy density. You can see that the one prepared with the highest energy density has quite high value of austenite finish temperature, 52 degrees centigrade, which means that this alloy might not be fully austenitic at room temperature. Okay, if we want to use it at room temperature, we may not get the complete pseudoelastic recoverability in this particular alloy. So with this information uh, on the basis of the microstructure, we did the indentation study at the first hand. Macro indentation does not show us much uh, variation in the properties, but if we do this uh, as micro and nano, uh, especially at nano, we have seen some variation in the properties and we particularly have seen some changes in the values for the alloy, which is being prepared uh, with an energy which is in between the high and the low value. Okay, so from microstructure, we could not say much uh, about the properties that it is going to generate. From the mechanical property analysis at local scale, we predicted that something is going out with uh, the one prepared with the energy density of around 50 joule per millimeter cube. Okay, uh, we found out the recoverable uh, deformation how much amount of uh, deformation that can be recovered and we can uh, see so this is basically showing the opposite of the, the remnant depth okay so this uh, red here signifies the remnant depth okay the plastic deformation and we have seen that this plastic deformation is least for the case of the e2 alloy prepared with around the middle of the energy term around 52 okay uh, when we found the stress strain curve from the indentation results, we again have seen that this alloy shows some pseudoelastic behavior, which is not apparent from the, uh, the other alloys prepared with the different laser energy densities. And um, when we looked at the, their behavior at the macro scale, so we make the real uh, life tensile specimen and we uh, looked into the tensile properties, we have seen that the one uh, of our concern, this is showing much higher uh, pseudoelastic recoverable strain. We confirmed the recoverability of strain as well by loading and unloading, and we have seen it. Now we wanted to figure out that why is that happening, and we could uh, correlate that with the digital image correlation, and we could see that the strain localization is uh, getting maximum for the uh, case of the uh, E3 alloy, whereas uh, in case of the E2 one, the one prepared uh, with the middle of the energy density is actually showing the best of the pseudoelastic recoverability and we can safely use it for certain application. So uh, this actually uh, uh, showed a glimpse of what can be understood uh, and the details can be found in publication like this. So what we basically have seen is that uh, 
if we are changing the atmosphere, if we are using a corrosive atmosphere or a different temperature of interest, uh, like for the case of uh, biomedical implants, it is the human body temperature that is of interest, that can have a huge influence on the properties and on the pseudoelastic behavior of the material. Similarly, um, if we are not changing the atmospheric condition, just by varying the microstructure itself, uh, we can have a, a lot to understand that uh, the different grain orientation or uh, the presence of precipitates or not can influence the properties also significantly. And in the third work, uh, where we have shown how, how additively manufacturing can be uh, controlled or can be manipulated as per our requirement so that we can achieve the targeted properties. So uh, with this, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, my, my group as well as uh, the collaborators from the different part of the world who has helped me and develop the various setups that I could um, and to gain some insight on this. And I hope I am able to at least instigate uh, the interest on this particular material. I'm not sure, maybe I have gone uh, too fast at some places or- uh, No, 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 not at all, Dr. Sen. Uh, anyway, Dr. Sen, uh, thank you for a scintillating uh, presentation on, I mean, uh, shape memory alloys. This is really um, opens a lot of doors for the people who are working into it. And uh, I now um, invite participants to ask questions. Dr. Sen, they have two options, either to unmute themselves and ask orally, or they may ask, uh, put their questions on the chat box. Actually, putting the questions in the chat box makes it more simple so that you can simply take it up one by one. So I request uh, you know, participants to put your questions on the chat box if possible, so that it's easy for her to answer one after the other. Uh, we already have a question. Uh, are you accessing uh, the chat box? Yes. Uh, yes. 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 I think uh, if you scroll up a little bit, if you scroll up, there yes. is- Yes, the first there. question I see is from Suraj. Uh, yes, uh, exactly, exactly. After that, you can okay. keep going down. Okay, fine. Uh, so, uh, Suraj Karanjikar has asked that how shape memory alloys are basically different from materials components developed using 4D printing technology. Uh, I mean, shape memory alloy is a particular alloy. Uh, it uh, does not depend on the printing technology that you're using. So basically uh, the alloy is still the same. Okay, it has some special properties of its own. So that is, what I can say, I uh, okay. Uh, so I think uh, it will be easier if the person who has put the question, if you uh, if you can explain me what exactly do you want to know, you can unmute yourself and yes. that is okay with the organizer. Mr. Suraj, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, please go ahead. In the later part of presentation, ma'am, you have pretty much explained the uh, most of the most of most of the uh, essence of it. Uh, in case of uh, uh, 4D printing technology, uh, during post processing, only once we can uh, basically change the shape or uh, the phases. But maybe in case of uh, as you explained, in case of phase change materials, uh, we can uh, do it uh, as much uh, times uh, we want. Yeah. And uh, I'm not very much sure in case of uh, 4D printing technology, if we can change the component, compositional, if we can bring the compositional changes. But uh, in case of phase change materials, that we can do so. Yeah, even uh, as I've shown in that additive manufacturing work, actually, uh, in at least for the case of 3D printing thing, we still have a... Uh, possibility to change the composition directly during the time of manufacturing itself. So it is possible. And of course, because of the, the variation in the uh, temperature patterns and uh, the heat affected zones, etc. So there is a variation in the composition as well that can happen, which may not be always controlled. But yeah, we, we can do the control part also. Okay, okay. There's a question down the line, uh, Dr. Sen. Yeah. Uh, is tungsten a shape memory element? 
uh, tungsten could be one of the shape memory. T tungsten by default itself is not shape memory. Uh, neither is nickel or titanium as such, but tungsten can be added, uh, especially for the high temperature shape memory alloy, we prefer to add tungsten. It can be a, a material in the alloy. Yeah, Dr. Sen, I don't think there are any more questions here. I just needed one clarification. In one of the slides, you showed a microstructure where all the grains were etched in color and some nano indentations you were showing. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it a, was that a real microstructure or is it a simulated microstructure? No, no, it's a real microstructure. It's an EBSD pattern actually. Electron backscatter diffraction. There was micro, uh, you know, you're showing the uh, indentations on it, yeah. Here. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The, so, the one on the left, yes. Yeah. Yes. That's so, a real one, yeah. That is a real one. That is a e electron backscatter diffraction pattern. All right. Okay, just, just a clarification. I think uh, uh, I, I can. I have some questions, ma'am. Please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Thank you, ma'am, for this. I have some little bit more questions, ma'am, so I can take 10 to 15 minutes. So, my first question is go to when you discuss about this safe memory alloy, where only total lecture describe about temperature and stress. So, my question is that can you make safe memory alloy by some other things, means by some chemical or by make some block, or you can say anything? Magnetic uh, field is another thing yeah, which okay. is important. Can there could be magnetic shape memory alloy? Uh, the principle of shape memory alloy, principally, I mean, it, it is related to changes in temperature and shape. Uh, chemical composition, do, what is your question? Can you no, ask that, me? Oh, yeah, that you got that good. That my question is that. It's stress and temperature is the reason behind to change the shape of alloy. So it's chemical reaction or other things can be reason for change the alloy? The reason for a change in uh, shape or remembering its shape is a phase transformation. Okay. By any means, if you are able to get the phase transformation, that can lead to shape in the alloy, ideally speaking. Okay. Now, uh, changing from one phase to another needs energy. And temperature or stress are the means of energies by which we are uh, supplying to uh, help the phase to change from one to another, right? So if uh, that can be achieved by any other mode, uh, ideally, technically speaking, that uh, shape memory can be achieved. But chemical reaction itself, uh, it needs some other form of energy to pursue the chemical reaction, isn't it? So how can... Uh, it can be a result, but uh, you have to apply some kind of energy for the chemical reaction to occur. And that energy that is obtained from the chemical reaction can lead to phase transformation. It has to be reversible. So, ma next, ma when you discuss about stress, so we are giving the stress perpendicular or parallel? Per perpendicular or parallel to what? To the alloy. Okay. Uh, now the alloy, I mean, if you're talking about the rod, for example, okay, we can apply the stress to any of the direction does not matter because we are having these grains and which are oriented along different, different direction. So let's say if we are applying stress, which are per uh, perpendicular to the rod direction, uh, it does not mean that all the grains will have the uh, the applied stress perpendicular or a parallel, right? Different grains will have different direction. And how will it deform depends on the correspondent variant pairs, right? So CRSS, as I said, uh, let me just go back to the CVP slide. Um, as I explained that for the correspondent variant pair to get activated, what is it? Yeah. Okay, so we need the uh, the critical result shear stress. We know that the critical result shear stress is highest at, at 45 degree, right? So whichever way we are applying, if there is one particular grain which is achieving this highest uh, uh, value of the, of the result shear stress, which exceeds the critical value that is required for the transformation, then only the transformation can happen. We ideally, while we are doing the experiment, we uh, do we can do it at any direction of our requirement. 
So when uh, regarding this diagram, I have a question. Make when you make habit plan, this is diagrammatically you make or you can really you can make one plan is a habit plan. Uh, we are not making this plan as a habit plan. This is just a schematical representation. Right. But habit plan is a real thing. I mean, we do not. Uh, I mean, we are not making it anything, right? If uh, one crystal pattern changes to another one, there has to be a common basis. That common basis is what is called the habit plane. And what will be the structure of this habit plane, the entire details is very well encrypted in the phenomenological theory of martensitic transformation. This is very well developed, of course, uh, theoretically developed. And people are uh, trying or people have tried in several locations to show it experimentally also. So with respect to habit plan, you can find the change of the shape. It's mandatory to one plane should be habit. It is, yes, there one plane should be always habit. Yeah. yeah this is the this is the crystallography of any material. It is not yeah. restricted to shape memory, right? It is for any material. If one material is uh, converting from one phase to another, okay, where it is changing the lattice structure, um, there should be one habit plane. One should be common. And when you discuss about heat flow versus temperature curve, can yeah. you go be, uh, before some slide? Yeah? Heat flow, okay. Before, yeah, this thing. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your question is that when you discuss uh, reformation of the shape from same, when it started, it will come to same shape. My question is that the temperature, when you see the curve, MSMF and ASF, the temperature is not in same peak. No, Why no. is it? No, they are not same. Uh, yeah. See, okay, this is a very interesting question. Actually, may I know your name? I Dhananjay. Dhananjay. Dhananjay, okay. Yes. Uh, this is a very interesting question in the sense that, see, um, we are talking about the reversible deformation, whether we are applying stress or temperature, we are going from austenite to martensite and back to austenite, which is completely reversible, okay? After the deformation is over, we do not have any trace to know that whether the deformation has actually happened or not. Uh, other than the, the data, we, just by looking into the material, we cannot say that, right? But when it is out of these two phases, this austenite and martensite, one of this is actually, uh, high symmetry phase and one of this is a low symmetry phase. In case of nickel titanium, the one, the austenite one having a cubic structure is a high symmetry phase, okay? Whereas the monoclinic one is a low symmetry phase. Okay, now uh, that leads to the differences in the exact temperature. When we are converting the high symmetry to low symmetry, versus when we are converting the low symmetry to high symmetry, okay? It is always energetically favorable to move to the high symmetry structure. Okay. So uh, that is why we can uh, not have the same amount of energy that is required for the conversion of high symmetry to low symmetry and uh, low symmetry to high symmetry. So that leads to a uh, variation in the values for the exact MS temperature or AF temperature. Is uh, you can say that due to loss of some energy, the temperature variation is coming due to deformation. Yes, yes. Then next is as you discuss about uh, so stress versus strain curve. When you discuss about any curve in two D plane like X and Y, we always taking stress is an X. Actually, means uh, cause is an X and effect is in Y. So, but in this time, in this uh, means in your session, I saw that stress is in Y and strain is in X. Why some, did you see that really? Yeah. Some no, stress, stress and strain curve. Stress is always in Y. Yeah, the, but when you're discussing some diagrammatic or some equation, at the time we're presenting Y is in Y axis, X is a cause, Y is a effect. So when you're changing the X, we are getting a different value of Y. Why am I saying this? Due to stress, there is a strain. Am I right, ma'am? Yes. Yeah, so when you make stress is in cause, then effect is strain. So when X is the cause, Y is the effect. So my question is that, why you took stress is in Y axis and strain is in X axis? 
I cannot recall uh, which uh, slide you are talking about. Okay, you can find any stress and strain problem in your slide because your number is not presenting. That's why it's very hard to. Let's yeah, see yeah, 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 yeah. Stress is in y axis and strain is in x axis. So my yeah. question, stress should be in x axis because stress is the. See, oh. this is a conventional way of putting stress and strain. You can put it in whatever way. Actually, stress and strain are interrelated. Okay, it depends on what we are controlling. In most of the cases, while we are doing the experiment, we control the stress yes. and we measure the strain in turn. We are doing tensile test. We are applying load. The machine learns the language of load. Okay, load and displacement. Whatever we are getting the displacement, we are estimating that or or. Uh, yeah, getting that from the thing, and we are replotting it as stress and strain. But you can put it as strain as y-axis. Does not matter. It will just a different way of representing. It. It's not standard. If we follow the ASTM protocol for that. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Next. Thank you, Mr. Dhananjay. I think. Uh, no, I uh, have two questions. Sir. You have two more questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. 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 Please uh, quickly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, before that, I would like. Um, uh, so the, I got another question from uh, Gopal Krishna. Yes, please. I think you should answer that first. Okay. So he asked that, does DRX affect the ability of the material to recover its shape? Yes. Dynamic recrystallization. Yes. Uh, it, uh, it, it may affect in the sense that uh, dynamic recrystallization is achieved if we are uh, heating it up to a certain extent, right? And as I said, the composition of the alloy is very much sensible to all such heat treatment, depending on whether we are using a nickel rich one or a titanium rich one, we are viable to generate some precipitates in the thing. So uh, first of all, in case of DRX, what we, get is the refined grain structure okay so if you're talking about the normal uh, plastic behavior such a refined structure is always favorable and it is giving us higher strength in this case higher yield strength i mean okay as per the whole pitch relation in case of shape memory or pseudo elastic behavior we are not worried about the uh, the whole pitch relation or the uh, strength at this moment or the yield strength at this moment rather we are worried about the martensitic transformation stress so uh, unless there is uh, any precipitates or any compositional changes that are happening this is not directly affecting uh, the ability of the material to recover its shape. But uh, again, refined structure in case of polycrystalline material means the chances for different grains to behave differently is different. Okay, which of the CVPs will activate and which will give more pseudo elasticity compared to other, as I have shown uh, the effect of grain orientation. So such kind of things cannot be taken into account. So uh, that sense, DRX structure may have some ability. It will be a nice uh, area to explore further, I guess. Well, Mr. Naranja, maybe you can have one last question. After that, we may yes. uh, break for lunch. One last question, please. Yes, Ma'am, in your last uh, study, as you discussed with the core between the flow and temperature, that should be totally cyclic. But in your, you see in the last some slide, that is not totally cyclic. Can you go, Ma'am, next? Ah, yes, yes. Right, right. Which one? So one way for the going to be fast. Next one. Next one. Yes, yes. This one. This heat flow was a temperature as you discuss in the theory part. You mean this with, part? Yeah, it's not totally cyclic. It is just truncated because we have done the experiment from plus 150 to minus 150. So you can join it. Uh, ah, yeah, you, that's true. Yeah, you can simply join it. It's a graph plotting software. Yeah, I think okay. uh, we so should thank uh, Mr. Dhananjay. Yes. Um, Ma'am, are you okay for one last question? Yeah, sure. And when you discuss about the two-way SME, is it important to remove by the Meisterstein structure? It is important to remove the mountain no, structure. No, remember. Means you told, is it important yes, two-way two shape memory is when it can remember its shape in austenite phase and it can remember its shape in martin side phase. It is important. Else it is just one-way shape memory. Thank you, ma'am.
I ask more questions. Sorry. Okay, no problem. I hope you understand. And yes, you may. Thank you. Ah, yeah, maybe uh, we come to the, there are no more questions in the chat box too. Uh, we come to the end of this session on behalf of uh, AICT Atal Academy, the institution, and on behalf of all the participants and myself, uh, we thank you profusely, Dr. Sen, if, uh, for taking your time off and uh, uh, you know going through the session. Thank you very much and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you too. And I really uh, enjoyed um, this lecture. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And